Hi, my name is Tracy Savile and I work at the Connected Places Catapult as their initiative lead. Over the next few minutes, I'll give you a brief introduction into what a catapult is and the type of work we do and give you some examples of some projects we are doing that are relevant to rural productivity. The Catapult Network was set up by government a few years ago to accelerate the commercial application of innovations which maximise the productivity and global competitiveness of key UK industries. All of the catapults work with innovators from across academia, industry and the public sector to prove and accelerate the adoption of breakthrough technological products, products and services. Um, in essence, catapults work with collaborators to make the industries of today more productive and to create the markets of tomorrow. The catapults do often work closely together as many of today's innovation challenges require collaboration across specialisms, whether that be developing a market for autonomous vehicles, creating a roadmap for smart ports of the future, or putting the UK at the forefront of all things net zero. Each catapult works in particular specialisms or sectors, as you can see on this uh, slide here. So, for example, we've got catapults focused on satellite applications, um, high value manufacturing and offshore renewable energies. Uh, last year, the Transport Systems Catapult and Future Cities Catapult uh, were brought together to become the Connected Places Catapult, where I work. And as you can see from this slide, uh, HQ is in Milton Keynes, but we also have offices in London, Glasgow and Leeds. The Connected Places Catapult's vision is for the UK to lead the world in creating places which thrive on their ability to connect people to resources, opportunities, ideas and each other, and where the smooth flow of people and goods drives economic success, productivity and well-being. Now, of course, whilst places can't change where they are located, by investing in their connectedness, whether that be digital, physical or social, they can create new opportunities for growth. As this slide shows, we work across both the supply and demand side of the markets. On the supply side, for example, we connect entrepreneurial SMEs with academic thought leaders, industrial partners and, of course, places to build demonstrator projects to test whether innovations deliver the expected value and also to clarify and remove any market barriers. We also help to develop standards, for example, to make it easier for companies to enter new markets and we deliver a broad range of support to innovative SMEs and startups, but a bit more on that later. There is, of course, little point in creating clever innovations if no one actually wants to buy them or indeed use them. Or to put it another way, as innovation is the application of creative ideas that build value, if no one values the innovation enough to apply it, then it's not yet an innovation. This is why we work closely with organisations, both public and private, to make sure that innovations are tackling known challenges and efforts are targeted at where they are most needed or to advance opportunities that are likely to bring value. This slide summarises where we sit on the technology readiness levels or TRLs. Our focus is on drawing promising ideas from the low TRLs that are often generated by academic research and pulling them through to commercialisation. So at the top of the scale you've got all the SMEs and uh, industry applying these clever ideas. Now, as we all know, the UK has some of the best universities in the world, but all too often it's other nations that commercialise that great work. It is therefore imperative that we keep close to the academic community so that we can connect them to these SMEs and businesses who are interested uh, in applying their work. Our academic engagement programme works extensively with a large number of universities from across the country so that we are aware of who is working in areas relevant to our Connected Places mission. We also have a network of what we call academic business fellows who alongside their um, current role in universities, they also work with us to service innovation opportunities from specific universities who each have strong credentials in mobility or urban innovation. So coming back to SMEs for a second, the rural economy, as we know, is dominated by SMEs, with around 7 in 10 people employed by registered rural enterprises working for an SME, compared to around 4 in 10 in urban enterprises. Our SME team engages with around 1,700 startups and SMEs in the connected places space, linking them to specific opportunities and events. It can be incredibly hard for an SME to access major organisations, and this is where we can help. We also run a mobility innovation focused accelerator programme with WAIRA, 
which gives directed support to some of the most promising SMEs on the planet. In looking through our database before this webinar, I've pulled out just a small number of SMEs who have at least a part rural focus. These include Level 5 Supplies, who as part of their work on autonomous vehicles are looking at how driverless cars could operate on unmarked roads. DriverNet are one of our Accelerator Programme graduates. They are digitalising patient and community transport to help optimise the service. Tandem are a social enterprise looking to end transport poverty and who are successfully developing innovations to help get people to work in small and mid-sized towns. And LiveShare is another Accelerator participant and they provide a digital platform to make car sharing across the country much more straightforward. As I mentioned earlier, our organisation was formed from combining one catapult with a city's focus and one with a transport focus. It won't therefore surprise you perhaps that the majority of our work on rural productivity has therefore centred to date on improving mobility. However, in our new combined organisation, we are broadening our scope to have a much stronger focus on the regions. I will very briefly summarise some of our relevant work, but actually Crest are running a webinar specifically focused on rural mobility later in the year. So the intention here is merely to be a forerunner to that event. Now catapults exist largely to address market failures, and there are clearly some worth tackling in rural communities as I'm sure you're all aware. Low dispersed demand means that there can be a lack of critical mass, leading to no supply, a monopoly supplier and no competition, or repeated but failed attempts to create vi viable services. And when considering access to transport, for example, these failures have wide re ranging socioeconomic implications. In discussions with various rural or local authorities, I've heard examples of students dropping out of college because they've had enough of the challenges of getting there and of people not being able to apply for jobs because whilst the public transport network might be able to get them to work in the morning, it can't get them home. People in rural areas spend between 20 and 30 percent more on transport than those in urban areas. This coupled with challenges of providing sustainable transport and closure of key local services can put people at risk of transport poverty. Now, accessible transport for people with disabilities has long been an area of interest for me and is a particularly pressing need in rural communities. Rural populations are older and ageing faster than their urban counterparts. Over half of England's rural population are aged at least 45 years of age, compared to around 40% in urban areas. In the UK, around 45% of those aged 65 or more has some form of disability or limiting health condition and therefore many might find it difficult to access forms of transport because of mobility difficulties, such as the lack of a, a footway or the distance to a bus stop. When bringing digital innovations for consumers to rural areas, these demographics need careful consideration to avoid creating a new form of exclusion where people cannot access services because of a lack of digital connectivity. We're all now to some extent experiencing rural living through the social distancing necessitated by COVID-19, many communities are working more together to help to connect people to essential goods and social support. Some people are beginning to feel socially isolated and getting concerned about their mental well-being. Getting food and popping to the supermarket is now an activity that requires a bit of planning and preparation, and perhaps even a bit of excitement at the chance to go outside. Accessing services is no longer straightforward. And we, are, we are experiencing connectivity issues as families negotiate to share the Wi-Fi. Last year, we worked with a leading figure on rural mobility, Jenny Milne from JLM, to run a rural transport convention for Scotland. In bringing together transport operators, charities, government and innovators, our intention was to stimulate creative force and to get more attention onto this often neglected topic. Some of the key messages we gathered are likely to have broader relevance to rural productivity in general. For example, the vital importance of community engagement to make sure solutions actually aligned to people's needs and challenges. Gathering the data to build compelling business cases for action and funding, including actually gaining a robust understanding of local demand to support sustainable innovation development and bringing together providers and stakeholders from different sectors in meaningful partnerships to explore new ways of working together. We also poured out a number of ways in which new technology can remove some of the transport pain points. 
Where connectivity exists, technology can, for example, service demand for innovations in new ways and give new, near real-time information about the location of services, thereby helping to remove some of the disconnection. It can also help to decarbon services by reducing unnecessary or inefficient journeys for inspecting infrastructure assets, for example. This slide summarises one of the ways in which we have exploited some of this technology to address gaps in transport provision. You may recall that I mentioned one of the things we do is to create demonstrators to test means of removing market failures. For this particular demonstrator, we brought together a team covering academia, local government, a major transport provider and an SME to create a digitally enabled on-demand mobility service. The core challenge was that employees were finding it difficult to reach an industrial park on the outskirts of Bristol. The team developed a demand responsive pilot where people could use their phone to hail a minibus service. This was a data-driven pilot where we undertook innovative travel demand modelling, drawing on, for example, aggregated anonymised mobile phone network data to work out where the end-to-end -end trip chains were being taken by people. This modelling approach helped to map out the target area for the service and to feed the route scheduling engine for the service. This service was also coordinated with bus operations so that people could seamlessly go from bus to minibus to work or home. The service integration led to around 20% in modal shift, where those who could use a car instead use public transport combined with this new mobility service. Inappropriate inadequate provision of public transport has resulted in rural areas becoming carbon intensive communities, strongly reliant on private cars, with almost a third more car trips per person than, than the national average, and two thirds more miles travelled per person than urban cities and towns. We have just started a rural mobility programme for the Department for Transport and we have an advisory inputs from two universities and Midlands Connect. It aims to support growth of digitally enabled on-demand mobility services in rural locations where public transport is currently not present or inadequate. In essence, the study will identify ways to improve accessibility and transport solutions in rural environments by improving the knowledge base around demand for new mobility services using data analytics coming from new data sources. This will allow us to create the foundations for new methods to predict the consumer demand for new mobility services in rural areas and begin by examining the feasibility of using different data sources, such as anonymized ag aggregated mobile phone network data together with community engagement to expose suppressed demand. By that I mean those journeys that people are currently not taking but actually want to. The intention is that ultimately stakeholders will have better tools for determining travel demand and therefore service viability in rural areas. And now briefly turning to two city focus activities that may have relevance to regional growth in rural areas. Firstly, one of the key ways in which the catapult brings about change is in convening multiple disparate stakeholders to nail the innovation challenges and opportunities. Sitting as we do as a neutral party working across the full spectrum of academic, industrial, entrepreneurial and public sector stakeholders, we have significant pulling power. This enables us to work across silos and build consensus for change and create compelling business cases. One example is where we supported the Belfast City Region, made up of Belfast and five surrounding councils in creating a proposal to feed into the Belfast City deal, designed to take advantage of digital technology to make the area a hub of innovation. The resulting £350 million of innovation funding covered improvements um, on infrastructure, employability, tourism and digital innovation. Our catapult worked with stakeholders to help build the case for investment for examining both the potential for new technologies such as 5G, but also looking at the importance of increasing people's digital skills to help create jobs for the future. And finally, our Cities Typologies programme looks at global urban innovation markets by evaluating cities against a set of indicators covering research and innovation attributes and market potential, such as level of investment, extent of collaborative working across academia and industry, and whether cities have future city strategies. We use this information to help UK SMEs working in the urban space area to export their innovative offerings to markets where they are most likely to succeed. I've included this work here as it could be interesting to see whether this approach or elements of it could be applied to UK rural areas.
Well, that's it from me. I've, I've hopefully given you a bit more of an idea about what Kentucky Places Catapult gets up to. If you want to know uh, any more of the work I've mentioned, I will happily put you in touch with the relevant uh, expert within the Catapult. And of course, I'm happy to take questions now. Thank you.